Coming up next, you're not gonna believe this. It's a band who owes much of their massive success to a random foreign exchange student. Uh, they were on the rise in their home country, but their records have failed to break through in America. However, after an American exchange student caught this band in concert in their homeland, he returned to America with their latest album, and he almost single-handedly broke this band in the States. I'm telling you, these guys, they made the most of it. They reeled off four number one hits and two number two hits. They achieved this in the space of just two years. I mean, more than most bands achieve in a lifetime. Today, we're covering those hits and giving you the inside track on their rise to global stardom. And we try to figure out what happened after that. These guys, they completely disappear from the airwaves a short while later. How does such a successful band just vanish into thin air? We've asked that question before, but this one, this one's a little bit different. You're gonna find out next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Tell you what, if you ever made a snow cone from the Snoopy snow cone machine or uh, something made out of the Easy Bake Oven, if you've ever eaten that uh, from the 80s, you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Uh, you gotta check it out. Subscribe below, click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Check us out on Patreon. We have more content there. You can become an honorary producer and help us keep this music alive. You know, today we're telling the story of a band. It's actually a duo that we've yet to cover on this channel. They were massively successful around the world thanks to a catalog of highly infectious pop rock at the end of the 80s into the new decade. Uh, these guys kicked out six songs uh, that either topped the US charts or came in at number two. Just a phenomenal feat. They actually had only one single during that time that failed to break the top 10 on the Hot 100. Uh, they were self-described as a feel-good band with a positive energy message. I'm talking about the ultimate hit makers, Roxette. Yeah, like Roxette, for a couple of years, they towered over everyone. All their songs were just sing-along catchy ditties. Comprised of the Swedish duo of Per Gessler and Marie Friedrichsen, Roxette formed in 1985 with the help of ex-ABBA manager Thomas Johansson. Uh, both Gessel and Friedrichsen were working on solo careers at that time. Uh, Pear, who was also working as a songwriter for Hire, was discovered by Johansson, who was looking for songs for Frida, formerly of ABBA. Uh, Friedrichsen, for her part, was also on the rise, having released three popular solo albums at that time. Johansson teamed them up and thought that they would do great together. That's what became Roxette. So songs originally planned for Pear's third solo album were instead repurposed for Roxette's 1986 debut record, Pearls of Passion. With the release of that record, Roxette almost immediately achieved tremendous success in Sweden. A home country hit, Pearls of Passion certified platinum there with nearly 300,000 copies sold. This put them in a prime position uh, to break through internationally, you know, especially with their next record. Roxette's second album was called Look Sharp. That dropped in October of 88, October 21st to be exact. It's inspired by Joe Jackson's 1979 album of the same name, Look Sharp. Uh, this was a triumph in Sweden. Now, unfortunately, it went unnoticed everywhere else, at least at first. However, thanks to the record's lead-off single, The Look, everything was about to change for Roxette. Now, initially, Look Sharp it wasn't even released in America. According to Gessla, EMI America had actually turned it down. They just didn't think it had any prospects at all. But then an American exchange student in Sweden named Dean Cushman, well, he helped this band. Roxette was about to take the US by storm because of him. So I guess Dean caught a Roxette concert during his time in Sweden. This led to him buying a copy of Look Sharp. He loved it. He returned home to America, Minnesota, uh, he brought the album with him, he showed it to everybody. Dean actually visited the Minneapolis radio station KDWB and he got him to play the look. Program director Brian Phillips loved this song when he heard it and he thought it sounded like a hit. So he played it on air to see what the reaction would be with listeners and the phone lines lit up. Listeners loved it, it was huge. Is a wild dog. She's got the look. She's got the From there, word about Roxette spread like wildfire. Cassette copies that look sharp. They made their way to radio stations across America, New York, Dallas, LA. Nobody knew who this band was, but the look was gaining popularity every day. 
When EMI caught wind of what was happening, they quickly released a look in the US. I mean, they had denied it the year before. Song went to number one in March of 89 and it began topping the charts all over the world. Funny thing is, for Per Gessler, it was just a throwaway track. I mean, how many times have we heard that? He just didn't think it was very good. He said the first two verses were just guide lyrics, you know, words he'd scribbled down to have something to sing. He couldn't come up with anything better and he ran out of time, so he just kept them. Elaborating on writing the song, Gessler said, and I quote, it was written for Marie, but it sounded terrible when she tried it out. Now, she needs bigger melodies so you can hear her fab voice properly. <laughs> Even so, for her part, Marie called it one of her all-time favorites and said it might be the best song that they'd ever done. To follow up the look, Roxette released Rest for Success. That one soared to number 14 on the Billboard Top 100. Coming off a chart topper, you know, that was a bit of a disappointment. But the good news was that Dress for Success was actually the only rock set single to miss the top two positions between uh, this band over the next two years. Everything was a hit. I'm gonna get for rock set's next US single from Look Sharp was a traditional power ballad. Listen to your heart. When he's calling for you, listen to your heart. Said Pear about this track, this big bad ballad, uh, this was us trying to recreate that overblown American FM rock sound to the point where it almost becomes absurd. We really wanted to see how far we could take it. But when it hit big in the States, we suddenly found ourselves lumped together with bands like Heart and Starship, which wasn't the intention behind Roxette at all. I don't think it's bad to be lumped in with those two bands, but anyway. So the song's lyrics were actually inspired by one of Paris' close friends who was going through a divorce, a difficult divorce at that time. According to the guitarist, the, the two friends stayed up all night and they talked about the split. Afterwards, Pear turned his friend's story into this song, which is basically just his advice to him. You know, listen to your heart. Listen to your heart became Roxette's second number one in the United States. Not long after that, Pear got a fax from his friend saying, hey, it's great. You and me and Marie are number one in America. Uh, Marie, for her part, was really proud of the music video. She recounted that it was recorded in the ruins of Sweden's Borgholm Castle, which is on the island in the Baltic Sea. She said the Americans wanted us to film there. They filmed from a helicopter as we played on stage in front of a large audience who were handed sparklers to hold in their hands. And I wore the short black dress and I was barefoot. It ended up with a very atmospheric vibe. One more anecdote about Listen to Your Heart. In 2011, uh, Pear told the story of passing through a New York airport. And so he was going through customs and the official asked him, you know, what do you do for a living? Pear said, well, I'm a songwriter. And he said, oh, really? Uh, have you done anything that I might've heard of? Just at that moment, Listen to Your Heart was playing over the speakers. So Pear just said, ah, I actually did this one. Perfect timing, right? Also in 2003, Listen to Your Heart was covered by the Belgian group DHT featuring MD. Their version was a US top 10 hit, reaching number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. It also went to number one on the US dance chart. Look Sharp's final single was Dangerous. Now, this one was written before Roxette's first tour in 1987. According to Pear, the lyrics, she's armed and she's extremely dangerous. Those were inspired by an early 70s action flick, though he wouldn't uh, say what the film was. But he called the song a nice piece of bubblegum. Now, Marie didn't like the song all that much, at least uh, not at first. She said, when Pear presented the song Dangerous to me, I was not enthused. I probably thought it was a little too tepid or a little too sugary. I was very skeptical. But now in retrospect, it's one of my favorites. Uh, end of quote. Actually, Don Johnson of Miami Vice fame, he didn't like this song either. Let me explain. At the time, Don Johnson was recording his second album, Let It Roll, and Pear sent him a copy of Dangerous. He thought it would be a good fit since Don, you know, his Miami Vice persona could be aptly described as dangerous. 
However, Don did not like it. He passed on it. He sent the demo copy back to him. Still, there were no hard feelings. Uh, Gessler didn't take it personal, especially since Dangerous was another massive hit for Roxette. It debuted on the Hot 100 at number 65, the week of December 16th, 1989, at the end of the 80s. Within a couple of months, it was knocking on the door of number one. Here's the thing though, Dangerous did go to number one on the Cashbox chart, so you could make an argument that Roxette actually had five number one hits. Ultimately though, it, it didn't make it over the hump, it had to settle for the number two spot. Actually standing in their way was Janet Jackson, of Rhythm Nation 1814, a historic album that scored seven top five hits, no album had ever done that before, including the number one Escapade, which was, uh, which was number one and held it out of the spot. As we get into their other chart toppers, I do want to thank our sponsor ZenEI, where the glasses that I always wear. Right now, you can get up to 80% off regular retail prices. Everything from reading glasses to progressive lenses to transition lenses, sunglasses. You can add amazing features like blue blocks that protect your eyes from digital blue light that we look at every day. Man, make sure to click on our info button right up here or our link below to get the best price. You're gonna love it. So next up was It Must Have Been Love. Although this one was a massive hit for Roxette in 1990, it was actually released as a Christmas single in Sweden clear back in 1987. Written by Gessler, the original title was It Must Have Been Love, and then parentheses Christmas for the Broken Hearted. To Gessler about it, we were doing promotion in Germany and went through hell because radio, they wouldn't play our records. They didn't know if we were top 40 or rock, and they just couldn't decide, and we fell between formats. So EMI's German division suggested that Roxette write a Christmas song to get some airplay, get them going. Pear did this. But after that, Roxette recorded um, this song, and German radio, they didn't want it. So they just released it in Sweden, and it became a big hit for the duo in 87. Fast forward to 1990, and the Richard Gere, Julia Roberts hit film Pretty Woman. Uh, Touchstone's Chris Montan, who was in charge of the soundtrack, he loved Roxette, big fan of the band. So he asked him for a song for the movie. However, since Roxette was on tour, Perry didn't have time to write one. So he just sent Montana a stack of demos. It included, it must've been Love Christmas for the Broken Hearted. Uh, actually, when Montana heard it, he flipped out. He loved it. He actually even had the script rewritten uh, to feature the song in a prominent position. The only catch was that the Christmas references, they had to be taken out and rewritten. So Roxette re-recorded it. They turned the lyric, a hard Christmas day into a hard winter's day. The revised track became Roxette's third US number one in June of 1990. Perry and Marie were invited to the screening of Pretty Woman. Perry admitted that he was actually a little disappointed. He was disappointed that only a minute of their song was used in the movie. He'd never had a song used in a movie before and he was expecting that they would use the whole thing. However, it was featured in a pivotal scene in the movie, of course. And of course, there was no complaints when Pretty Woman hit the jackpot at the box office and raked in uh, $463 million. Uh, the film was a monster success, and It Must Have Been Love was right there with it, along with the other big hit, uh, King of Wishful Thinking. Good, but I lost it After the smashing success of It Must Have Been Love, Roxette kept busy, and they wrote their follow-up to their multi-platinum album, Look Sharp. Uh, they stuck with the tried and true formula, and this new record was called Joyride. It was a mixture of upbeat dance tracks and emotional soft rockers. Actually, the album title was inspired by Paul McCartney, who in an interview described writing songs with John Lennon as a long joyride. As Gessler recalled, at the time we were in the middle of recording and I was just looking for a fun, you know, positive title for the album. And Joyride, it just seemed like a perfect word. The word by extension, it also summed up the record's first single, of course. Likewise named Joyride. You, come on, join the joyride. In addition to Paul McCartney's comment, there was another inspiration for this song. Uh, one day, Pear discovered a note that his girlfriend had left for him on his piano. I guess she'd gone out to do some shopping and in the note, in Swedish, it read, hello, you fool, I love you. Pear thought it, it, it was perfect. It would make the perfect chorus for a song, so he just went with it. Describing the track, the guitarist said that Joyride was another three chord song with a lot of magical mystery to her and also a lot of T-Rex in it for good measure. Hello, you fool, I love you. 
Gessel also added whistling to the song, and this was after watching Monty Python's Life of Brian. Uh, the 1979 movie features the whistle-heavy song Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Pear said, I did the whistling myself. It's overdubbed 12 times, but I did it. Roxette was absolutely confident that Joyride should be their lead single for the new album. However, EMI, they disagreed. They thought an up-tempo track would be risky, especially in light of the duo's recent success with It Must Have Been Love. Uh, rather, they wanted to push for the ballad Spending My Time, another track from the album. Uh, but Pear and Marie, they pushed back. Joyride, it became the Pear's fourth chart-topping hit. Spending My Time was ultimately released as the album's uh, fourth single, I believe. Uh, turned in a much less impressive number 32 on the Hot 100. It definitely made the right call there. My time. Now for the album's second single, this time Roxette did go with a ballad. They chose Fading Like a Flower Every Time You Leave, parentheses. Per Gessler commented on the choice of that tune in the liner notes of the band's greatest hits collection, saying, uh, That's us in those days, a pop tune followed by a power ballad. This was written in a hotel room in Canada in late 1989. A lot of people said we sounded American. I always thought we came more from the English pop tradition. Hard to tell here though. Uh, interesting. That's kind of how it was in the 80s, right? You released the big rocker and then you put the power ballad out. So it wasn't anything new there. So from there, Fading Like a Flower soared up the US charts, reaching the top 10 in just eight weeks. Actually four weeks later, it climbed to number two, uh, it was kept out of number one by another parenthesis song, the Brian Adams juggernaut, Everything I Do, I Do It For You. I do, I do it for you. Unfortunately though, uh, much like its title, once Fading Like a Flower reached its peak position, it quickly faded into the background. It actually dropped out of the top 10 the following week and just fell down the charts. That more or less marked the end of Roxette's dominance in America. Uh, the aforementioned Spending My Time was eventually released as a single, failed to break the top 30. So did their next release, Church of Your Heart. That stalled at number 36. Now the album Joyride did certify platinum in the States. It did really well. But by their next album, it was like they'd completely fallen off the map. They were gone. That next album was a live tour album called Tourism. It featured three of Roxette's mega hits and the single How Do You Do. Now, internationally, the record was a smash. It sold six million copies. However, neither Tourism nor How Do You Do move the needle in the States at all. Former peaked at number 117 on the latter uh, went to number 58. Other stateside misses followed, including the Super Mario Brothers movie track, Almost Unreal. That one tanked at number 94. Do you remember that one? Babe, coming from the cold. But you know, although things were slowing down in America, Roxette was still ramping up globally. For example, in their home country of Sweden, they were a huge hit. The duo kicked out 17 more top 40 hits after that. Through 2016, Roxette released a total of 10 albums, most of which certified platinum across various countries. So it's not like they vanished in the thin air, but they did in America. So what happened? Why did their popularity decline so suddenly in the US? You gotta tell me what you think in the comments below. I gotta tell you, I always dug rock set. It seemed like they were a band that was between the lines, pop and rock. They had the feel good, hooky 80s rock pop sound. But as we got further into the 90s and grunge and alternative started to make its way to the masses, uh, rock set kinda was in the gap of rock and pop. And it didn't flow with where music was going. Still, it really is mind boggling how a band that had four chart toppers and two number twos in just two years could completely disappear from the airwaves. Of course, Roxette continued to make waves international, like I said. And then in September of 2002, Friedrichsen started to feel sick and her health began to deteriorate. Uh, she collapsed in a bathroom after feeling dizzy and due to the fall, she fractured her cranium. She then had a, a seizure. And later, doctors found a brain tumor in the back of her head, which led to canceled tour dates. And after waiting several weeks for the effects of the fracture and the concussion to go away, uh, she had surgery to remove the tumor. Uh, it was successful, it was found to be malignant. But even so, she went through months of chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Unfortunately, her health would continue to worsen for the next 17 years. 
uh, to the point where doctors said that she could no longer perform live. Sadly, on December 9, 2019, Marie succumbed to cancer. And she passed away and she survived by her husband and two children. Now, a concert in memory of Marie Friedrichsen took place in Gothenburg uh, about a month and a half later, featured performances from Per Gessler and Eva Dahlgren. The concert was actually broadcast in its entirety in Sweden. And then on the first anniversary of her death, the song Sea of Love, an unreleased uh, single, was put out. Man, Marie Friedrichsen was such a gifted singer and performer. I mean, for a couple of years, she and her partner, Pear, were the toast of radio, outperforming virtually everyone on the charts. I mean, very few bands or artists have had a run like that. Six massive hits, big, huge hits, and they're songs that we still hear today. It was one of the greatest two-year joy rides in rock and roll or radio history. Thanks, Marie. Empire. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Roxette. What are your memories of these songs? What are your favorites? Let us know in the comments below about Marie. Let's have a great discussion about her. She was such a cool front woman and Pear is such a great songwriter. I mean, I really, I love these guys. Such catchy songs. Uh, what's your favorite? What, what's your top three from them? Uh, if you like her content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, records and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.